on today's World Insight with Tim Wei. Back and forth, hot and cold, the DPRK and the U.S., where are they now? And how to play the coup in a coalition government with big promises on the economy. Our exclusive interview with Italian Minister of Economy and Finance, Giovanni Tria. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. We begin today's program with diplomacy in the Korean Peninsula. There's been another about phase from the White House, which is now saying there will be no joint military exercises with South Korea. President Donald Trump also held his personal relationship with DPRK leader Kim Jong-un. The announcement this time comes less than 24 hours after Defense Secretary Jim Mattis said there were no plans yet to suspend any more major military exercises in South Korea. So whom to believe? What will be the impact of the two very different announcements on the U.S. DPRK relations? Take a look at this. U-turns and flip-flops have been the hallmarks of the Trump administration and Wednesday was no exception. President Trump tweeted a White House statement saying, the president believes that his relationship with Kim Jong-un is a very good and warm one, and there is no reason at this time to be spending large amounts of money on joint U.S.-South Korea war games. But it seems the president and his defense secretary aren't on the same page. Less than 24 hours earlier, Jim Mattis had hinted at resuming the drills with South Korea. We took the step to suspend several of the largest exercises as a good faith measure uh, coming out of the Singapore summit. Uh, we have no plans at this time to suspend any more exercises. The joint military exercises between Washington and Seoul have long been a sore point for the DPRK's leadership and the Trump administration agreed to suspend some of the exercises after the Singapore summit as U.S. diplomats advance nuclear disarmament talks with Pyongyang. Things seem to be moving in the right direction, but now it changed. So far, follow-on negotiations between Washington and Pyongyang regarding the details of a nuclear disarmament deal have stalled. Last week, the Trump administration canceled what would have been Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's fourth trip to Pyongyang for talks. Meanwhile, U.S. officials have said the DPRK's nuclear and missile programs are still progressing clandestinely. Despite the U.S. announcement, Seoul says the scheduled inter-Korean summit will go ahead as planned. South Korea and the DPRK have agreed that their leaders will meet in Pyongyang next month, and the two Koreas held reunions last week for families separated by the Korean War. South Korea's top national security advisor said on Tuesday denuclearization is a very important and difficult issue to resolve. He also anticipates resumed negotiations between the DPRK and the United States in the near future, saying both sides have a firm willingness toward talks. So what happens now to Korean Peninsula diplomacy with U.S. and South Korea military drills still in the cars? Well, I can't answer that question. Maybe my panelists could help me in that regard. Let's ask them. With us in our Beijing studio, Zhao Tong, who's an associate at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Welcome, sir. In Washington, D.C., we invited Jenny Tao, a research analyst at the Stimson Center and the managing editor of 38 North, an expert on the DPRK issue. And joining us in Boston, Jim Walsh, who is with the Security Studies Program of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program. First of all, Mr. Walsh, assuming that you could read the mind of your president, so joint military exercises or not, not joint military exercises, visit or no visit to DPRK. Mr. Walsh, please help. Well, I'll do my best. Obviously, I cannot read the mind of the president. But I think, the pre you know, going back to before the, the Singapore summit, he seemed personally invested in North Korea and uh, North Korean diplomacy as an issue. You know, whether it was because of the 
hint of a Nobel Peace Prize or whatever. He seemed very deep, more emotionally committed than I've seen him to, to other issues. And so I think for him, the, with Mattis saying we're going to, essentially saying we're going to resume military exercises, uh, he reacted to that quickly, strongly, as is his style, and independently of talking to anyone, because he doesn't want to see the North Koreans resume a nuclear and missile test, mm. because then the whole promise of the summit would come crumbling down. And so I think he's, he's committed to it. He has a different point of view than his staff and advisors and his cabinet members. And those differences are playing out live uh, on Twitter. All right. Ms. Town, despite what is going on, the war of Twitter, let's take a look at what has been the reason of this flip-flop. Ms. Town, there are media reports suggesting, we do not know whether reliable sources are behind this, though, that there is some kind of under-the-table discussion and even some kind of apparent agreement between the United States president and also the DPRK leader about a peace declaration and about the denuclearization, a mutual process with one another. Ms. Tao, some suggesting it's because the U.S. did not follow its promise as the DPRK sees it, and that is why we're coming to this point. Ms. Tao, do you think this is believable or not? Well, I do think it's believable. You know, it's hard to say how reliable these sources are, but, you know, certainly more happened at the Singapore summit than what was in the declaration itself, and it's never been clear as to what that is. Mm. Um, but I think if it is true, um, I think we have a real credibility problem now. And I think, you know, there, as Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump have built this relationship, I think both sides feel they have the ability now to escalate issues to a higher level if they're unhappy with the direction that they're going, and that both leaders are supposed to respond in a way that would keep the process moving. Um, if the president did promise something um, and is now, and the administration is now trying to change that and make it conditional, certainly there's there's reasons why North Korea would be angry with that of moving those goalposts. Mm. Um, but I think you know the question is going to be. With Kim Jong-un, you know, if you escalate to Kim Jong-un, he can overrule the bureaucracy. Um, I think they're looking to Donald Trump now to see, can he overrule the bureaucracy if it's a decision that the administration doesn't like, um, but the president has said he will do. Mm. Of course, uh, whether they have the capabilities of overrule the process and the administration is one thing, but what is the exact purpose of that overruling definitely is probably more important than the capability itself. Uh, having said that, though, Mr. Zhao, you know, there are several things. Joint military exercises were jo not joint military exercises. Visits by the Secretary of State or his special representative to the DPRK were not going. Uh, and another thing is possible, more sanctions or not more sanctions. All these are different layers of pressure. Obviously, the Trump administration is trying to convey to Pyongyang right now. Uh, Mr. Zhao, will they work, though? I think we have been there, um, and Trump knows that. If we everyone goes back to the fine and fury uh, state, status of affairs, apparently that's very dangerous. Even recently, the former uh, U.S. special representative for uh, North Korean affairs, uh, Ambassador Joseph Yun, in an interview he said he himself was extremely nervous last year about the possibility of a military conflict. So no one wants to go back to, to that status. I don't think the, the U.S. Uh, strategy of imposing more pressure will work. I think my theory of interpreting uh, President Trump's strategy is President Trump knows very well that Kim Jong-un wants to go to UN in late September. Mm -hmm. He wants to take the floor of the UN General Assembly and he wants to engage with other national leaders in New York. But in order for to achieve that, he needs to make quick breakthrough uh, with this, with North Korea's relationship uh, be, uh, with the uh, United States. Uh, so uh, the, t the time is a little more on the American side. So President Trump basically is signaling to, to uh, Kim that, look, I'm not in a hurry, but you are. Um, so I can wait. I can wait even after the trade dispute between China and the United States is resolved mm -hmm. before I talk to you again. So now the boy is back in your court, make your decision. Well, it could be his assumption whether that is the reality or not is another question.
I'm not sure whether a leader, in order to make a speech at the General Assembly, would sacrifice what he considered as the most important uh, interest uh, when it comes to its security. Having said that, though, this is an interesting question, isn't it, Ms. Tao? I mean, President Trump, we know he always blames others, but this time it's too obvious when there's a, you know, a state, state a stalemate rather between uh, DPRK and the United States on the nuclear issue, he blames China. So convenient. Um, you know, so out of everything he said about China recently, particularly when there's a, a apparent trade war going on here. So, Ms. Tao, <laughs> I have to report to you today, the foreign ministry spokeswoman uh, brushed it off and say, we just cannot respond to things like this. So we are not capable <laughs> of responding to things like this, meaning the remarks coming from the president on Twitter. Ms. Tao, how should we understand this mentality and psychology? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. <laughs> oh, um, all right, you know, I think... <laughs> I think, you know, there, there are a lot of things at play right here, and, and certainly there's a, a, very, um, a very difficult domestic situation as well that I think on some level, you know, you, the president is trying to distract from the domestic political turmoil. He's trying to distract from potentially what could be seen as a diplomatic failure and pointing to something that he thinks is one of the strengths of his administration is being tough on China. So I, I think that's a little bit of what's happening here, a little kind of smoke and mirrors and diversion. Um, but certainly it's not going to solve the problem and it doesn't win us any friends um, if we are trying to, you know, for instance, impose more sanctions or encourage you know, continued implementation of sanctions, it's hard to really make that case of you should be working with us when we're beating you against the head as well. So mm -hmm. it, it's Whatever the, the rationale was for doing it, it probably wasn't the most well thought out. Mm. Well, Mr. Walsh, it is no secret that President Trump is not a person that plans. He only thinks about today, not necessarily about anything tomorrow. So, Mr. Walsh, having said that, though, uh, what does it mean when he's taking this, you know, get by but today as much as possible attitude and mentality to the joint ally relationship in a way? Uh, South Korea, Japan, and meanwhile, the earlier partners in the six-party talks, China, Russia, at least on the issue of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, uh, what would that mean for this apparent partnership now seem to be further on the verge of collapsing? Well, I think we have to say that the president is reactive by nature. He himself describes himself as a counterpuncher. He often lashes out when he's angry about something and does so independently. He doesn't really coordinate with his advisors or even his allies. So I think that's sort of standard fare. As it plays out for the um, allies in the region, I think it plays out very differently. On the one hand, my guess is, is that President Moon is relieved to have heard these tweets uh, saying that the relationship is good and that there won't be a resumption of drills because he's in the middle of launching a, 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 a rather large inter-Korean dialogue process. You know, they've had the family reunions. He'll be meeting Kim again, what, for the third time now? I can't remember. So he very much has they a have policy the of wanting as to well. affirmatively engage. Yes, exactly. And we'll pro they're probably going to talk about case. I mean, there are all sorts of things that are on the table here. And I'm, I'm guessing that uh, President Moon was a little nervous uh, given uh, Secretary Mattis's comments and also the president's cancellation of the Pompeo visit, I think uh, the tweets, you know, as of yesterday, uh, now give him essentially the green light to continue to go forward. I think for Japan, Japan has always, I think, in the region had the toughest stance towards uh, North Korea, and they're probably wondering, you know, what is tomorrow going to bring? Are we going to have yeah. another reversal of policy? Uh, followed by that. So I think for the, the allies it's okay. I think if you work for the Trump administration, if you're Mike Pompeo or someone else, right. your job is getting more difficult because you say one thing and your boss cuts you off at the knees. And so if you show up, in, if, if Pompeo shows up in Pyongyang, uh, you know, um, a month from now, the North Koreans, you know, probably ignore him because they know it all comes down to the relationship with Donald Trump and whatever right. the individual advisors or cabinet members say doesn't matter as much. So I think uh, it's empowered President Moon and it's disempowered the Secretary of State.
Interesting the way you say it. Uh, Mr. Zhao, I want you also to respond to the two questions asked the other two panelists earlier. One is about uh, blaming China so conveniently, China's response as well. The other thing is the apparent collapse of this uh, you know, consensus among different parties of the earlier six-party talks as a result of this flip-flopping attitude coming from the Trump administration on the denuclearization issue. Mr. Zhao. Well, on China, in his latest tweets, President Trump basically said uh, he knows North Korea is receiving tremendous pressure from China because of the U.S.-China trade war. Uh, basically, he's implying that China is pressuring North Korea to slow down on the progress of denuclearization and be less cooperative with the United States. I think that simply doesn't make sense. Um, China, you know, is already a country that is surrounded by nuclear weapon states like Russia, India, Pakistan, United States, and it doesn't benefit China at all to add another nuclear weapon state in the long run. And mm. China always concerned that U.S. and other powers might use the excuse of a nuclear-capable North Korea to present a bigger military presence in this region to threaten China. So of course China wants to see quick and immediate progress on denuclearization. Um, so if Trump believes in that, I think he's simply uh, uh, disloyal. And also, uh, he might be knowing that there is a possibility that Chinese President Xi Jinping might be going to Pyongyang as some uh, media reports. Uh, so he might, he might want to see how China might be able to, again, uh, use this influence over North Korea to push North Korea towards um, uh, denuclearization. Mm -hmm. On the um, allies question, um, I think it's certainly true that uh, President Trump is making it more uh, difficult for mm -hmm policy coordination between Washington and Seoul and uh, Tokyo. In fact, he does not only uh, dispower uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo, he also dispowered his newly appointed special representative, uh, Mr. Steve Bigwin. Right. Basically, in his recent move, he uh, powered himself, right. uh, presenting himself in the center of decision making and making everyone else less important and uh, more irrelevant. That's the, uh, you know, very bad for, for Mr. Uh, Bigwin. I think um, looking at South Korea and Japan, apparently they don't see eye to eye right. uh, either. Um, but uh, behind the scenes, I think there are also interesting moves from, from Tokyo. There is a recent report that there was a secret meeting mm -hmm. uh, between Japan and uh, North Korea in Vietnam in July. And some uh, people were working on uh, pre preparing for a possible summit meeting in November uh, between the Japanese Prime Minister and Kim Jong-un. Right. So I think basically two allies, they don't want to be left behind. I see. Uh, uh, Ms. Tao, from now on toward the end of this year, this is going to be a very busy schedule, even on the U.S. calendar. You got the midterm election certainly, but before that, there's the UN General Assembly, as many of you have mentioned earlier. There's later going to be also G20 and APEC during some of these occasions. If things are working toward the positive direction, certainly it could be a platform in which parties can meet and come up with further good news. But things would go the other way around as well. Ms. Tao, before the midterm election, is there going to be any hope about things getting better? <laughs> well, you know, at, it's hard to say. You know, it's always hard to say. Um, you know, everyone knows that you know, you know, Tao, there is the interest. I know in exactly general. what you're going to say, but I just want to <laughs> test you with that little question because I remember exactly, you said exactly the same thing last time I asked you on the air. <laughs> so let's put away that test, little test question. Let me ask you a more fundamental question. Eventually, what do you think, Ms. Tao, given the changing picture of geopolitics, let's just say between China and the United States, and also in the Asia-Pacific region, what will be this issue of DPRK mean for all parties, Ms. Tao, your thoughts? Well, certainly this is an important issue, and it's an issue that everyone except North Korea feels that North Korea's nuclear weapons are a problem. The question is, you know, what are we willing to do to solve the problem? 
I think the problem now is the, the approach that we're taking has been a very high profile, you know, high level meetings and these summits, but this isn't how you work out details. And as we've seen, the details in this meeting have been very, in these meetings have been very vague and very hard to track. Um, and so it's hard to track progress in order to really establish what these goalposts are and establish of are we getting anywhere and are mm. we getting what we want. You know, I don't think we're going to see any substantive progress until we have an actual negotiating mechanism in place, where it's not just from meeting to meeting, but actual negotiators, such as, you know, the new special representative, um, Stephen Began, to be able to sit down, you know, with the North Koreans over a course of, you know, weeks and months and really hash out the details. Mm -hmm. Because what we have now is just simply, you know, declarations and summits and promises, some of which we know, some of which we don't know. Right. And again, it, it's very difficult then to assess how, how is the process going. All we're seeing is public relations, all we're seeing is tweets going back and forth, but is that really what we're supposed to see okay. or not? And, and we just don't have a good clue. Right. Ms. Tao is suggesting we're not even starting yet the real process. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Walsh and Mr. Zhao, 30 seconds for both of you, very briefly, your final thought, Mr. Walsh. Yeah, I agree with Jenny. I, I think uh, w what we need is an actual negotiation. You know, it took three years to negotiate the Iran nuclear deal. It's going to take some time. Uh, but I don't think things are going to change. We're going to have the chaos in the news headlines, but I don't th expect things to change by the end of the year, uh, certainly not before the midterm elections, because right. I think the president wants to have this relationship, and, that's, and that will carry it through at least through November. Well, Mr. Walsh, you are very good at kicking the can down the road. Mr. Zhao, final words from you. Less than 30 seconds yeah. left. I think it's justified that some people are still very suspicious about North Korean sincere in denuclearization. But we have a chance to test that, right? Uh, if North Korea wants to improve relations and may feel safe and therefore uh, surrender their nuclear weapons later, why don't we give them the chance to prove their sincerity? Well, as the song goes, give peace a chance. We hope it is a sign of the peace. Thank you so much, the three of you, for helping us to update what's going on and have a better insight about exactly what the realities are. Thank you. Zhao Tong, Jenny Town, Jim Wash, really appreciate it. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program. How to play it cool in a coalition government with big promises on the economy. Our exclusive interview with the Italian Minister of Economy and Finance, Giovanni Tria, right after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live Monday to Friday on CGTN. In June, Italy welcomed the new coalition government. The new Prime Minister, Giuseppe Conte, proudly endorsed the labels populist and anti-establishment. But the government has had a baptism of fire as Italy's economic situation proves more complicated than its political one. Despite the nation's rising debt, the coalition has promised social welfare, tax cuts and pension reform, and it firmly believes its ability to deliver. To find out how Italy plans to deliver on these promises and the future of its economy and financial state, I spoke with Italian Minister of Economy and Finance, Giovanni Trea, recently in Beijing. In general, in the last um, years, the gap is uh, around 1% of, of difference in, in the rate of growth. Mm -hmm. But we, we can increase, we want to increase the, the rate of growth through public investment because we already have many funds in our budget. We don't need additional funds, but we have some problems in implementing this, infrastructure, this, um, this investment because some bureaucratic and normative obstacles that we are going to eliminate. Mm. But we understand you are having a coalition government, right? And that is how the complexity comes from. And therefore, as a member of that government, uh, with different parties involved in the governance, how would you keep that balance? 
how would you make sure the funds are there, the money will be spent, and it will be spent on time, and there will be results, Mr. Minister. If I think about your job, my mind is already boggling. But this is the job of all of the <laughs> finance ministers worldwide. Well, <laughs> it's not my particular job. In, in all the government, mm -hmm. the job of uh, many ministers, like education ministers or health, uh, etc., their job is uh, to attract budget mm. for the objectives. The job of the uh, fin Minister of Finance is uh, to keep uh, this uh, request compatible with the objective uh, of the government in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of budget. The debt issue for Italy is a challenge. Right now we see your president, for example, has apparently got promised from the Trump administration to buy some of the Italian debt. We have also seen you and your colleagues going on around the world communicating with people and governments about the debts. All the news about uh, it, Italy that is going on around the world uh, asking for help for our debt is a fake news. It's a fake news. Uh, um, the, the news about what uh, our Prime Minister asked to Trump and of course it's a fake news that I, I, I came in China for the same reason. I'm here just to uh, support the, uh, the good bilateral uh, collaboration and partnership between Italy and China mm. because uh, we don't need this kind of help. We are convinced that the domestic as well as the uh, foreign investor will decide according to their interest if they want to invest in our public debt. Till now, all the investors that did that uh, had uh, some very good return. Mm. Why do you think there are fake news like these circling around about Italy? It's a political fight, of course. Within the country? Within the country. And therefore, with very different political environment, you started as an economic professor and later on built your career in the international organizations. But how would you, mainly a technocrat in a way, be able to survive and thrive so that many of the important things that you consider for Italy's economic future will be implemented? Mr. Minister. I believe that the one <coughs> become minister is no more a technocrat. He's become a political minister. I don't think that exists some uh, not political uh, uh, political ministers. I'm a part of a government. The government has a, a program. My job is uh, to implement the, this program according to my capacity. So you're ready to fight? No, I don't think they have to fight. We agree on the program of the government. We agree that we have to implement in the best way the program. And we agree that we have to implement gradually mm -hmm. the program because the sound basis to implement the program is to have the trust of families and companies in Italy and uh, the international investors, mm. then uh, all, the gov all the government is totally aware of that. You mentioned a lot about infrastructure throughout our conversation, Mr. Minister. Yes. As you may know, this year also fifth anniversary already of the Belt and Road Initiative, otherwise known as the BRI. It's supposed to be a platform and an initiative to make countries and all kinds of players to come together about connectivity, about cooperation on infrastructure. So the question is, 
how much opportunity does Italy see in this initiative? We think in, in Italy that the, the Belt Road Initiative is a real great project. It's um, a very comprehensive strategies, strategies for collaboration between, uh, between countries. Then uh, the Italy is uh, strongly interested in participating in this, uh, in this uh, big project, uh, both uh, along the, the land route connecting Asia and Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, along also the, the maritime route connecting through the sea, mm. Asia, China and uh, Europe. And of course we think that uh, Italy, for a historical point of view, but also looking at uh, the, the modern time and the future, can be the natural terminal of the, the maritime route mm -hmm. of the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. And we can have a partnership in, a third, in order to operate uh, in uh, third countries, or in China, or in Italy. But we, we understood that uh, this project uh, is a project that is not limited to the economic uh, issues, but it's a big project that is important, important to uh, increase the collaboration between uh, the countries involved. And in this way, it's possible also to govern the big change in the economic, uh, in the in the global, uh, the big change in the global economy, in a collaborative uh, mm. uh, way. You talk about it's not just about infrastructure; it's also about connectivity, about many areas. But the question is. Even if, when it's only about infrastructure, it's already taken a long time because we know building infrastructure, maintaining infrastructure, let infrastructure buildings eventually be economically viable. It takes a lot of time. But the world is changing so fast. And administrations in Italy, of course, we have seen some changes over the years. So the efficiency, speed, and the aspiration, how do you reconcile all of these factors together, Mr. Minister? I believe that uh, just because uh, the world is changing so fast, the risk of investment is increasing, of private investment. Mm. This means uh, that uh, the government and the, the public institution should give uh, a framework a strategic framework for investment. This is a very important. Mm. Otherwise, uh, in, a, in, a, in a world with a very fast change in technology, maybe the private investor without a, a general framework can't deal with the, the yeah. increasing economic risk. So a vision is very important. A platform, a new rule of possibilities is very important. Yeah. But then how is that compared to what is going on right now? I mean, Mr. Minister, as an economist, you know better than I do. The unilateralism, the rise of it, whether it's in Europe or in the Asia-Pacific region and around the world, the rule of the jungle, as they say, has become apparently the rules of governance these days at least by some politicians, and the different roles different economies play, developing, emerging, and developed economies. The division about ideologies as well, not just political ideologies, but how the world should be run. So, Mr. Minister, I want to really invite your wisdom about this too. What is going to be the rule of the game? And how does Italy come into this discussion of the rule of the game? Of course, we can design rules for a global governance uh, through dialogue. Uh, these rules should be convenient for uh, 
what we call now the advanced countries or the emerging countries. But maybe in the next futures, the positions in this kind of rankings between countries will change. Then always when you design the, re the rules of the game, you don't have to think the position that we have now, but also the position that, that we can have in the future. If I would ask you to sum up with one sentence as to where Italy stands in this global debate, where are you? I think this, in this debate, uh, Italy can have uh, um, a big role because it's a country that uh, traditionally is very open to the world and uh, it's convenient for Italy mm. and it, I can say also for Europe to be open. I don't think that uh, we can benefit, benefit from, for example, protectionism. We have to, we can benefit from uh, open markets. Mm. Of course, uh, open markets depends also on the rules. Free market doesn't exist in nature. It's uh, a product yes. of rules then we need dialogue to design the more appropriate rules to keep open the markets. So you don't like trade wars? No, I like uh, open markets uh, mm. for trade. We don't, I don't like protectionism, but I understand why some protectionism can, r yeah. can rise. We have to eliminate the, this, uh, these reasons just to keep uh, free exchange. Well, open market and free trade, as the minister said, is not necessarily a new idea. It's been there for a long time. 2075, Italian merchant and explorer Marco Polo traversed the Silk Road to the Yuan Dynasty in China. Almost 750 years later, China revitalized together with partners around the world the Silk Road and Italy has played a proactive role in this process. So what will be the legacy of Chinese and Italian cooperation in the 21st century? Italy's Minister of Economy and Finance Giovanni Tria talks about his nation's pivotal role in the modern Silk Road as he sees it. What is likely to be the sustainable foundation for China and Italy when it comes to interactions in the financial field and the interactions about trade and economic issues. We can have a partnership in uh, many fields and many sectors. There are uh, many, so many complementarities between uh, China and Italy. Mm. We can take advantage, we can uh, profit of these complementarities, uh, mm. um, developing synergies. Like what? Synergies in all the fields, in investing in infrastructure, in uh, technology, in, uh, in food, in uh, aerospace, uh, in many, se in, in many set sectors. Mm. We have uh, Italy is the, the second manufacturer in Europe, country in Europe, and uh, the, the seventh in the world. And uh, China is developing uh, an, an high level, high quality industries uh, with high technology. Mm. Then we can put together these uh, technologies and we can, uh, in this way, invest and uh, operate in, in China, in Italy, and yeah. also in the third countries. This is 40 years anniversary of China's reform and opening up. At this point, many Chinese are thinking, hmm, what have we done right? But at the same time, they're also thinking, hmm, what still needs to be done? As an economist and a minister, in an economy that certainly needs a lot of efforts to revive, what do you consider about these two questions, Mr. Minister? And 40 years ago, I was in Beijing. You were? Yeah, yes. What did you do then? At that time, I was a young researcher at the University of Rome, and I came in China, Beijing, just to study the 
Chinese economic system. I was very interested in this system. How long were you here in China? I witnessed uh, the the start-up of the reform in the 1978-79. And now I I can't be really admired. I can say emotionally and intellectually looking back at the at what China did, at the progress of China, from the economic point of view, but also keeping social stability. It's a, in a country big as a continent. And I think that I'm optimistic for the future, because what Italy and China share is uh, many thousands of civilization. Mm. Looking back at the history is the, is the basis for innovation, mm. is the basis to build the future. Uh, what I used to say that Italian and Chinese can talk about past and future at the same time and the reality and the present as well. Yes, of course. Mr. Minister, what a pleasure. Thank you so much and very good luck to your work. Thank you, it's a pleasure for me. Thank you, sir. Well, that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insights CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.